So one of the things that I've learned in dealing with my heart and the situations that, that I've gone through with it is just because you're fit, just because you can do certain things athletically doesn't necessarily mean you're healthy. And so many people find themselves in this same position where they go, hey, I can go out and run a marathon, I'm fine. Or I can go out and ride 100 miles on the bike, I'm fine. And then they overlook symptoms because they think that that's just part of the training. Yeah. I know I did that for a long time. Um, I remember being at the velodrome, training after sprint practice and curling up into a ball in, in, in just in knots after an effort. Turns out that yes, while I'm fit, my muscles weren't getting oxygen and I was nodding into a ball. And that was my personal, one of my personal experiences with it. Yeah. So if I was to say that to you, just because you're fit doesn't necessarily mean you're healthy, what would you say about that? I, I would say you're absolutely right. So just by being a human being and uh, living in this world, we are all at risk for high cholesterol, high blood pressure, um, diabetes. These are things that naturally happen to us, and whether it's genetically pre-programmed into us or whether it's environmental factors. We don't eat as well, we don't take care of ourselves as maybe we should. So exercise is great, but it's just another mixture into that pot that then comes out a, a person. So, and, and that's true of the cardiology world in general. And these things are all risk factors, right? So blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes are, are one side of it, but then you take exercise and maybe that's a beneficial thing. Maybe that staves off some of these things, but it's not, a, it's not immune therapy. Exercise is not going to cure these things. In, in certain cases, yes, it could. But just because you can ride 100 miles on the bike or run a marathon does not mean that you don't have high blood pressure, does not mean you don't have high cholesterol, does not mean you don't have a significant family history of coronary artery disease or blockage in the artery. So the exercise is great, but we should be aware of our risk factors. What is our blood pressure? What is our cholesterol? Um, what is our family history? And then at the same time, really being in tune with our body. So as you said, something was wrong. Like you could go out, you, you could bike, you could do your sprints. You were getting that done, but then you'd hit the end and, and you'd curl up in a ball. That was not right for you. There, there was something off and wrong about that to you. And, and we can't prevent everything from happening. Uh, one of the leading endurance athletes in Australia died and it raised a whole, whole controversy. Well, did the exercise cause it or was it something else? And, I, I say, and other people would say, maybe the exercise prevented it from happening earlier. Mm -hmm. Maybe there were symptoms that he ignored. Maybe there were symptoms that other athletes have ignored that they tried to push through and, and, and unfortunately suffered consequences as a result of that. So understanding everything, especially as we get older as athletes, and to me the magic number is 35. Before the age of 35 as an athlete, you're probably safe from these cholesterol, these blood pressure things. Not to say it can't happen, but the, the, the stats and the data would argue against that. When you cross over that 35 age group, um, you, you now become a master's athlete, which is always a hard thing for all of us to accept. <laughs> yeah, to tell me about it. <laughs> um, but number two, then I think you really need to start paying attention to these risk factors and understanding what your family history look like and, and taking that into consideration, getting good medical care if that's something that, that's a priority to you. Certainly from our standpoint, we would recommend that. And being aware and understanding that just because you do these things, you can run a marathon, does not mean you should ignore that chest pain, does not mean you should ignore that time you passed out when you were running, or that shortness of breath that seems a little bit worse than it did a couple months ago. These are things to pay attention to. We also, most of us, train using a heart rate monitor yeah. or a power meter. Yeah. And that, is there anything that you would see on a power, on a heart rate monitor that would uh, give some give you concern that somebody should be yeah. aware of so I'm a proponent of those things as long as you understand what the data means and you understand how to use it if you're just saying oh my heart rate's 170 that's great I hit that no problem you know you have to understand what that data means and know how to interpret it um, for someone who's well versed in that information I would say a slower heart rate recovery would be concerning so you know if you're getting your heart rate up to 160 170 you stop and your heart rate's still hanging out around the 150s 160s and you're feeling symptoms, that might be a good concern to me. If you, you know, speaking of cycling, if your power zones, your numbers are decreasing within those power zones, that would be concerning as well. But really, again, an individualized basis, having the understanding of what your data means and then knowing how to interpret it on the other side. And then speaking to somebody who can interpret it as well is important. Maybe have some, if you notice some kind of anomaly or something Correct. weird. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when I had my first atrial fibrillation, yeah. 
episode and my heart rate hit 240 beats per minute yeah. while I was um, sitting on my couch, I knew something was wrong. <laughs> and so many times we just play it off to stress or to something else and, um, and, and it could be something much more dramatic than, than that. Correct. And so yeah, I think being a really aware of yourself and we all are i mean athletes, athletes sure. i could tell you what my resting heart rate is my max is yeah. what my vo2 I, I could tell you all of these numbers and and probably most of you can as well so be be uh, cognizant of changes or things that are off and don't just blow it off as to hey it's just a one-time thing if you see something weird Pay attention to it and see if it happens more consistent yeah. is um, one of the things that, that I'm seeing. I'd rather reassure somebody, have somebody come into my office and me say everything's okay, you're checking out fine, as opposed to the other side of it where something has happened and now we're talking about how do we get you back or can we even get you back to where you were before. Sure. Yeah. Now you had mentioned to me a couple times about the three pillars yeah. of sports cardiology. Can you tell me what, yeah, so you know what that is? When I, when I break down sports cardiology, I, I like to think of it in three realms. So the one realm is screening. So somebody who's feeling well, really wants to exercise or has been exercising vigorously and wants to make sure that they are okay, that, that's one aspect. The second aspect would be someone like yourself who's exercising actively, but something's not right. And, you're noticing decreasing performance or palpitation, racing heartbeats, chest pain, things that are abnormal. How do we evaluate that? So evaluating an athlete with complaints is sort of the second pillar. And then the third pillar to me is taking an athlete who then has had an issue that's been diagnosed and treated, and how do we get that athlete back into a performance level that he or she is comfortable with, if it's even possible to do so. So that to me sort of encompasses the sports cardiology world in a nutshell. Is there anything else? that you think is important for people to know or that you'd want to add? So you touched on atrial fibrillation and I think in the sports cardiology world that, that deserves specific mention. And atrial fibrillation, for those who may not know, is a, an abnormal heart rhythm uh, originating from the top chambers of the heart or the, the receiving chambers, the, the left and right atria. And the reason that's important is because it, when we think of atrial fibrillation in athletes, we know that for people who are sedentary, people who don't exercise, there's an increased risk of atrial fibrillation. With moderate intensity, low to moderate intensity activity, there's actually a decreased risk of atrial fibrillation. With men specifically, the more vigorous exercise you do, specifically endurance, there's actually an increased risk of atrial fibrillation. So if you think of it as a J, where on one end you have sedentary people, an increased risk. On the bottom end of the J, people who are moderate intensity activity, protected from the atrial fibrillation. And then on the other side, males who do endurance exercise, increased risk of atrial fibrillation. So that, that may make a lot of sense for you. Women actually are protected all the way through. So uh, the more exercise you do as a woman, you are probably protected from atrial fibrillation the further you do. So that's an interesting nuance. And, and for folks who are vigorously exercising active endurance, this is something to be aware of. So the palpitations that you have you may want to take them seriously. We would never discourage someone from exercising to prevent atrial fibrillation because again all these things i've said before exercise is healthy it's the best thing you can do for yourself but being aware that with vigorous endurance exercise someone who's doing this at a very high level this may be something that you have to deal with sometimes i know when i had the afib yeah. um, i felt the palpitations and some chest pains and yeah. just kind of felt like hey that's what happens when you're training you, yeah. you have the chest pains is afib dangerous in and of itself, atrial fibrillation is not dangerous. The heart rhythm cannot kill you, it cannot harm you. It can be pretty burdensome, as you can attest to, to everybody out there. It can make you feel unwell, it can make your performance decrease significantly, but the rhythm itself is not dangerous. Where atrial fibrillation comes into play is the risk of strokes. So atrial fibrillation is the leading cause of strokes in this country. And what happens is blood pools inside of the heart, and a piece of uh, blood can, when, when it does pool, a clot can form and a piece of that clock can break off and travel to the brain. And these are all the commercials you see on television like Xarelto and Eloquiz and uh, previously Coumadin as well. Um, we use different calculations and risk factors to incorporate who should be on blood thinners and who shouldn't. Um, but the rhythm itself in a vacuum, no, it can't hurt you. For athletes, it's gonna make your performance not be great because it, the heart is going to be functioning inefficiently. Some people who have atrial fibrillation never get back to the performance that they had and we don't completely understand that mechanism. Okay. Now I hear other 
uh, arrhythmias and, and people talking about other arrhythmias yeah. like VTAC and, yeah. and things like that. Um, are they going to have different symptoms than an AFib? And what symptoms are really symptoms to be concerned about? Yeah. And what do you do so when that happens? Yeah, two very uh, two very important but different discussions: VTAC, ventricular tachycardia, and VFib, ventricular fibrillation, um, certainly have made headlines. Very different than atrial fibrillation. So these are very dangerous heart rhythms that are usually a sign of underlying heart pathology. So being some type of defect in your heart that would be very concerning. Um, that warrants immediate medical attention and consultation with myself and electro, or, you know, cardiologist and electrophysiologist and figuring out why that's happening and how we're going to treat that. And the guidelines would suggest that if you have that, your, your uh, participation in sports or any type of physical activity should be limited. So that, that's figured out why. Signs and symptoms of that, so chest pain obviously would be a concern there. Really the biggest one would be passing out. So if you pass out during exercise, if someone is running or they're biking and, and all of a sudden, boom, they're out, very, very concerning. Should be taken seriously on every level and worked up thoroughly. Um, other things, palpitations, racing heartbeats, as you've talked about, declining performance, abnormal shortness of breath, so shortness of breath that is out of proportion to the exercise that you're doing. Um, these are all complaints that we see often and would warrant further considerations. Now, not necessarily going to be a heart rhythm issue, but if we discover these heart rhythm issues, we really have to work our way through. You do something about it if you discover it. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. If, you yeah. discover, if you don't discover it, you can't do anything about it. That's correct. It. Yeah. How do you feel about caffeine and uh, sports performance or caffeine and, um, and exercise? Yeah. Some, I know different people have different feelings on it as a cardiologist, yeah. how do you feel? I'm a proponent of caffeine, I think it's great. There are a lot of different forms of caffeine we can take in, so for me it's a cup of coffee, I, I'm okay with that. Other forms of caffeine I'm not okay with. So if you are doing the supplements over the counter, caffeine pills, I'm not a fan of those. I'm not a fan of sports drinks, so things like Red Bull, Four Loco, Monster. Uh, there is increasing data that these types of drinks may be responsible for dangerous heart rhythms and sudden cardiac death or, or people who are performing and all of a sudden die from a dangerous heart rhythm. Really? So those types of things I urge people to stay away from. There's these supplements out there called pre-workout. I encourage people to stay away from those. If you want to drink a cup of coffee 30 minutes before you, you go out to run or bike, I'm completely okay with that. I would limit people to no more than two cups of coffee a day. Okay. And not putting in what I call the Snickers bar stuff on top of it either. Cream, sugar, all that fun stuff. Don't stick, put it stick to black coffee. You can do it. Yeah. Oh, it doesn't taste as good. No, it's, still, it's better. <laughs> <laughs> it depends. See, uh, yeah. w when I'm down in Miami, yeah. they put so much sugar. Rocket fuel. Yeah. Well, then the, what happens is the expression is, is the sugar gets you and then the caffeine gets That's you. And it's, like right. a, it's like a double whammy. Yeah. yeah. And uh, well, the this gets, are... this gets into your whole thing of, you know, you can be fit but not necessarily healthy. So putting all that sugar and cream into it, you know, you're, you're loading your body with sugar and, and fats and all these different things that, frankly, you don't need. So black coffee. So my, my friends in Miami, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I'm really sorry to bring you this news. And um, oh wow, um, so, today, so, so today is what, Tuesday, tomorrow morning and uh, Friday on your Wednesday and Friday rides, um, when you go to the Oasis Cafe, <laughs> make sure that you get it without the sugar. Um, Good luck with that. <laughs> but this is just uh, the recommendation. The bitterness of the coffee is as good as the burn during the workout. So just enjoy it. <laughs> Learn to love it. Yeah. For people that don't live in South Florida and don't have access to you, how do they find a sports cardiologist? So uh, there are a lot of people out there who are say they, they are sports cardiologists, as you mentioned, but it's more of a hobby for them and not necessarily an integral part of their practice or you know something that they're passionate about. How do you find these people? Well, this is a, I wouldn't say a newer field in cardiology, but I think it, it really, it's been around, but it's really growing. It's really taking on shape right now um, and still relatively young. So th the first thing you want to do if you're searching for a dedicated cardiologist and, and someone who's a sports cardiologist first is make sure the person you're going to see is a fellow of the American College of Cardiology, meaning they've been board certified. They've, they've completed a three-year fellowship. They've taken their boards. They're certified. That, that's really important. That's certified as a sports cardiologist? No, just as a general cardiologist, because I think that's really important. There are a lot of people out there who are practicing cardiology, 
but they're not board certified. They, they haven't gone through the rigors of a fellowship or taken the board exam and, and met the standardized criteria. So that I would say is number one. Number two, um, you can have a discussion. So just as much as you can go to different grocery stores and figure out which one suits your needs best, you can go to different cardiologists, you can go to different practitioners and say, and, and meet with them and, and have a discussion and see if that fit is right for you. So um, have that discussion, see if you gel, see if there's someone who takes the time to get to understand you and, and understand what goes into to being an athlete. Maybe they've done research in the field, maybe they are a team doctor for high schools or colleges or a dance club, whatever the case may be, that they're actively involved in the field. That tells me, as someone who works in the field, that they're taking an interest in it. They're staying up on the literature and the data out there. There's something called the Iron Heart Foundation. It's a website, you can Google it, which is a repository of people who, who do treat athletes. Um, it's growing, I wouldn't, wouldn't say it's necessarily 100% up to date at this point with everybody who's out there, but I think it does encompass people from all over the country who are comfortable treating athletes. So that's a resource as well. Um, and you can also see the sports and exercise section on the American College of Cardiology website. That's a resource for patients as well. Excellent. Yeah. I will put all links to all of this in the show notes. Uh, I'm also going to include um, Eli's office number um, for any of my people in South Florida that know me. Uh, I, I would I would highly recommend talking to uh, to him. Um, like I said, it, it really changed my life and uh, I'm really grateful for you and, and grateful for this. Uh, I don't have anything else that, that, uh, that I, I feel pressing to, to ask you unless there's anything else that you want to add. Um, if anybody has anything, that, that any questions, concerns, anything that you uh, are curious about after seeing this interview, contact me. Um, send, send me a note either at ridersrepchannel at gmail.com. You can also leave a comment below and I'll make sure to answer everyone's questions. Um, please uh, subscribe to the Riders Rep Channel YouTube page as well as our social media on Facebook and Instagram. If you have any anything that you want to see come up in terms of topics or if you think you'd be a good guest on the show, please uh, contact me as well. I really appreciate you guys watching and I hope this makes a difference for your lives. Keep pedaling.